Given that the world's in lockdown mode at the moment, I thought, how about for this episode, we have a chat to a driver? And I've been lucky enough to snare Roman Grosjean. I'm sitting outside here in Western Australia on a beautiful balmy evening. On the other side of the world is Roman Grosjean. Good evening, Roman. Morning or evening, depending where you are. It is good morning. Tell us, uh, you're in lockdown mode like we are in Australia. What are you getting up to? Well, yes, it's, uh, it's a tricky situation. And uh, obviously, we all have a big task to uh, road to play and, and, and stay home as much as we can. So, yeah, I, I stay home. Uh, obviously, I've got three kids. Uh, two of them, they need to have school lesson um, during the day. So... We try to do at least three hours of, of school and then also a little bit of training, um, home trainer or cycling indoor and then using a bit of garden and elastic bands and stuff like that to uh, keep up the form. So you're taking over the teaching duties with the youngsters? I am taking over the teaching duties with my wife. Uh, it's uh, it's not, not easy, uh, to be fair. We're trying to do the best we can, but obviously we weren't trained to be teachers. Let's jump back to the Australian Grand Prix that didn't go ahead. When did you hear that uh, you wouldn't be racing? Uh, well, the, the rumours starting happening on Thursday evening. And uh, actually, for some reason, Thursday to Friday, I didn't sleep very well. So at 3 a.m., I was, uh, was WhatsApping with uh, Sebastian Vettel. And I was like, why are you, why are you awake? And he's like, I'm going to the airport. I'm like, <laughs> what? And uh, yeah, he was gone. He was gone to the other one. He was like, it's cancer, it's not happening. I said, I haven't heard anything official, so I'll stay around. But he was like, no, no, my team has told me that I'm free to go, so I'm gone. So yeah, like, like 3, 4 a.m. on Friday morning in, in Melbourne time, that's when I knew things were going to not look great. It was pretty interesting in the paddock too. There was all sorts of signs that we weren't racing, but no one was saying yes or no. And obviously there was a lot of behind the scenes stuff going on. But uh, yeah, real sad event. And then of course now we're missing the first seven races and really there's no guarantee we'll start in Canada in round eight, is there? No, it is not. I mean, it's, uh, we just need to wait on the situation goes. I think the bigger picture is much more important than going racing, um, even though it feels very strange to be home at that time of the year. For me, we're in January. I can't take the fact that we're almost in April because my whole body clock is due that January I'm home. I do the training block, then February I go winter testing, and then March I'm able to race But no, we are in April and I'm home. Let's talk about your training. You've got an Aussie trainer, Kim Keedle. When did you first employ Kim? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, I met Kim through... Uh, the team has a continuous actually initially physio for the mechanics and uh, and then starting getting on very well and so, yeah I mean, we've got a good relationship uh, mm. most of the time is nowhere but uh, we like it okay so a lot of people want to know about drive to survive i think that really did the world a good for you kevin and in particular gunter have you watched the whole first two series actually i finished the uh, i finished the season two yesterday uh drive to survive I will not watch season one just because 2018 wasn't a great year for me and uh, I don't really want to get back those memories. But uh, I, watched it, uh, I watched it and Netflix is doing a, a great job. Actually, you know what, I think uh, they should have more crews coming to the races and have, have more crews through all the teams through different races because obviously you never know what's going to happen before the weekend and they, they kind of pick up the Sergei Haas, the American team, so we're going to come with them in. America and Austria because they did well last year and then we're going to go to other races with, with other teams. But uh, if there are three or four cameras, then I think we would, be, we would have more entertaining content. But uh, for Formula One, for the fans, for everyone, it's, it's pretty good. You said you wouldn't watch the 2018 year um, for Netflix, Drive to Survive. And I was actually in Melbourne uh, when your car broke down after that pit stop and I was right across. And this is the photo I took you with your hands, holding your helmet, and uh, what was going through your head when you stepped out of that car? Obviously, we've been racing for a long time, so we know that uh, things can uh, can go wrong, I don't know you were. Uh, but yeah, 2018 Melbourne, definitely we were, we were super competitive, um, running fourths and fifths, I believe, in the race with Kevin. I didn't know he had a problem with the pit stop, and I pitted the lap after, um, went out and was asked to stop the car. And uh, you know, at that time, you're like, What's going on? I can't believe it. At the start of the season, you got a high expectation, and and things just don't go your way. Um, so, yeah, after 2017, also that was a tough year. Um, it just, it just 
wasn't the right time. It's never a good time, but that, that was definitely the wrong time. I want to jump to uh, Monaco, and this photo here uh, shows uh, you coming around at a swimming pool, the Exeter swimming pool, and us photographers stand behind this knee-high fence, and really, what are we looking at? We're looking at maybe um, 60 centimetres from you. Do you see us photographers when you round that corner? I'm sorry to disappoint you, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't see you. I mean, uh, no, we, you know, Monaco, especially Monaco, it's so much focus going on, and, and you really need to be looking at where you're going and where you're going to put your wheels, that you, everything that is outside of, of your racing line is just non-existent. I've had some bizarre requests just as a photographer. I remember somebody said to me, could you please smell Lando and tell me what he smells like? You must get bizarre requests given that you have such a huge social media presence and you're a driver. Well, I've never been asked to smell anything. People obviously commenting on, on what you do and then some people supporting me and some people uh, trashing me or say. Uh, generally, you know, I think it's great. We get, we get to share as much as we can and during those those tough times where everyone is home also it's good that we all, all share a little bit of um, joy we're all in the same situation if you are wherever you're in the world we're all, we're all at home so at the minute i think social media has got a big role of helping people to go through those those moments um but no we had requests i mean maybe i didn't read them maybe i skipped them but uh, i mean i don't really have any in mind now we had a chat uh, in testing and you were saying that ideally you'd like to be able to have a chat with drivers around the paddock, but um, that's just not possible, is it? Well, no, it's, it's a bit complicated to, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of fans in the paddock and I know Formula One is very difficult to access. So whenever the fans are in the paddock, they really want the selfie dollars of us. So whenever you join two drivers together, having just a casual chat, then it becomes a, a selfie session and uh, obviously, yeah, we sometimes we try to hide ourselves a little bit and meaning that we actually don't get much interaction between the drivers, um, which is a bit, a bit sad because it's, it's really what we like doing and, and we're passionate about racing and I'm sure there's a lot of things that we can, we could talk uh, together. So I guess next time we just have to walk into the other guy's motor room and have a chat and a coffee. Do you remember the first time that it struck home to you that you were uh, in the F1 game, that you're suddenly everybody wanted to know you? What was that moment? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's Valencia 2009 where I started my Formula One career. Um, and yeah, I mean, the media uh, point, the uh, photographers in front of the garage when, when you go out for your first F1 session, um, so much attention. Um, it's, it's quite crazy. And also, you you're very stressed, you know, you're not very comfortable and you haven't have had much practice with the car and you need to go out there and drive it and, and make sure that you drive it fast and, and safely. So um, it's, it's pretty tricky, um, but also a pretty good moment. You know, I've got some pictures from the, the press conference and then from the leaving the garage where you, you see all those cameras around and think, oh, well, you know, that's, that's a pretty cool memory now. Uh, any corners that terrify you? No, there's, there are corners that I absolutely love and they are absolutely they're incredible to drive. There are, funny enough, other corners during the season that you just don't really know how to take them and you know you're going to be a little bit slower than your teammate and, and just the feel has never been really good. Um, but uh, like for me, turn one in China, I mean, more turn two, the pathway gets tight. Mm -hmm. I've never really find the right as a line and speed uh, way of doing it and uh, it's really important that I, I, I don't I dislike and because it's it's just not somewhere I know I can I can get quick lap time. Same thing as the chicane in Barcelona before the, the main straight. I just I just don't like that corner. I can be I can be fast, but I just don't like it. Whereas if you talk about uh, Spoon in Suzuka, double right of Le Bosse in, in Paul Ricard, uh, Turn one is to the goal, so many corners uh, that I absolutely love. You cop a fair bit of stick from people, but you're pretty good natured about it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I am happy with what I've done. I'm happy in my, you say, I've been good in my shoes in French. And uh, yeah, I mean, people, they, I'm quite happy actually that they like me or they dislike me. Uh, much better to be that way than having the charisma of an oyster. <laughs> and you're, uh, you're quite the cooking aficionado. 
I love cooking. Um, actually, you prepared a video last week. You giggled a lot, but I didn't uh, set the GoPro right. Uh, I can't post it, so I've got to do another one, uh, another recipe. Um, but yeah, it's a good time to, to cook and to cook healthy also. Make sure we've got plenty of vitamins coming in and plenty of nutrition to, uh, in this too. Make sure your immune system is as, as strong as it can be. I asked my Instagram followers to come up with a few questions. I thought I'd give them a chance to ask here. Uh, Ellie Sadler says, on track, can you hear the fans in the stands or just the engine? No, just the engine. And also we've got hair pieces in, in the ears that are molded to the, the hair, so they're already the noise, it's cancelling noise if you want. And uh, we've got the radio in there, so it's, yeah, can't hear. Sorry. And, and when you talk to the uh, guys on the pit wall, do you have to press a button or do you, is it just constant communication? No, you just press the button, then you talk, and when you finish talking, you press the button to, to switch it off. And um, we normally talk on the braking, because that's where there is no engine noise behind. So you press the button before braking at the end of the straight line, and then when you jump on the brake and you're actually downshifting, that's where you're making, doing the talking. Paulus GRN says, best race of your career, and how did it affect your future career? Recently, I'll say, I don't know, maybe Bahrain 2016, it was just a great race. We had a very aggressive strategy using a lot of uh, super soft cars at the time. And we finished fifth with Haas um, on our second race, which was absolutely incredible. And I remember fighting the Red Bulls during the race and, you know, just, just having fun. Kim from Australia, Kim with an I, says, why do you always lose to me at squash and table tennis? Oh, yeah, <laughs> why do you always lose at squash and table tennis? I mean... Oh, sorry, Kim, but uh, if I, if I, if I'm being honest, I mean, last time you had a very bad day uh, at table tennis and squash. Kim is pretty good, surprisingly. I mean, he's he's, he's a giraffe, so yeah. he doesn't even move on the court, and he's got everywhere. But uh, yeah, table tennis, we we're having a lot of fun, and you know, all those games they're fun, but also they're good for high high and hand coordination and, and reaction. So. Everything we do is actually having a sense behind the scene. Brett from Melbourne asks, what's it like going up Eau Rouge? Uh, going up Eau Rouge is, is it's fun. It's, uh, you know, the first lap uh, you go through, you've got a big compression at the bottom and then you go up and then, and then you go again flat. And when you finish that going up and then starting going flat, your stomach goes up and down. And actually every year on the first Push up, I feel sick. Like my stomach is like on a roller coaster. Yeah. And luckily, it disappears from lap two onwards. If not, I wouldn't have a good day. But it's it's quite a funny uh, funny feeling. Have you ever been ill in the car and had to stop or felt like stopping? Oh, early in my career, I think it was in Formula One or two liters. I um, I didn't position the seat belts properly uh, between my legs and uh, yeah, the strap was was positioned on my jewels. Yeah. And every time it was breaking, it was so painful that I actually had to pit and, and redo the seat belts. Luckily, it wasn't a race. I think it was maybe a qualifying session. But since then, I'm very careful when I jump in a car to put all the things in the right position and make sure that the, um, the, the seat belts that come between from under your, uh, your ass, between your legs to your crutch strap, are well positioned. Just a couple more quick questions. Larissa wants to know, why did you choose the French license, not the Swiss? Well, I started racing as a, as a Swiss, under Swiss license, but then I started racing go-kart in France. And then uh, eventually when I moved through my careers, um, I became a Renault driver, development driver. And for Renault, obviously, it, was, it made more sense to have a French driver and a Swiss driver. And then Total, the oil company also was a big partner of mine. And um, obviously, it's a French company, so supporting a French young athlete would make more sense. So yeah, I um, I mean I don't. It, it initially was I guess marketing reason, uh, but no, I really feel as a as a French athlete, but as a Swiss man also. So if you ask me what I'm in real life, I think I'm Swiss. Yeah. But um, but as an athlete, I'm French. Aiden the train boy says, how big was the smash door after Kevin broke it? Uh, it wasn't broken. No. It's good quality. The the trucks are very strong. I mean, uh, yeah, I um, I left it there and kept my mouth shut and thought this is a really good time, Bourgeois, not to speak. <laughs> Beat Cyber Squad says, what's the best thing to put in an omelette? What's the best thing to put in an omelette? Yeah. Um, I mean, 
many, many things, but a, a raclette cheese with a bit of ham, or even, even if better, you get some good smoked ham from, from the mountains and some raclette cheese, and you just made it very heavy, but it's so good. Are you a fondue man? I love your fondues. Oh, fondue is so good. I mean, I could, I could eat it uh, all day long, but then I, I wouldn't fit in the car, so I just need to be, make sure that I'm careful with that. And finally, uh, Eduardo Back10 says, if you had to pay for the damage to all of your house cars, how much would you be in debt? I don't know. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, when you race, you crash sometimes. It's, you know, our job is to push the car to 100%, if not more, at all time. Uh, and therefore, when you try to reach that 100%, and sometimes you go above the limit, and then you crash. So, Yes, Formula One are very expensive. It's a very expensive world, but um, yeah, uh, luckily I haven't had to pay them, so um, I don't know. Well, look, I do appreciate you taking 20 minutes out of your busy schedule. What are you getting back to this afternoon? I'm going back to uh, teaching the boys, uh, some getting some school with the boys, and then probably I'll have uh, one hour on the own trainer, um, on the turbo trainer back home, getting the cardiovascular system uh, kicking on. Rama Grosjean, merci beaucoup. Merci. Before I leave you, please remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already done so, and click the bell if you want to get notifications of future videos. All my picks, you'll find them at ProStarPicks.com. For my best picks, though, head to Instagram at Kim Illman, live from the track, and all during the week. Thanks for watching, and stay passionate.